Next to me is Mark Kennedy. He's one of our architects in the Semantic Research Lab. We're going to talk to you today about a little bit of proactive security against the malicious code that's being written out on the net every so often, distributed in various forms. Let's, Mark's going to uh, help out here this morning and uh, actually stick around till the end because he's got some really neat stuff on the other machine that we're going to show you later on. All right, so I've been starting my presentations for the last year and a half or so with a great quote, at least what I think is a great quote. I'm going to see if anybody has the answer to this. Security is to the internet as somebody. Wake up, people. Didn't hear it. Intelligence is to the military. Yeah, that works. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> Sounds like a ringer. <laughs> Bicycle is official. I'll give you a hint, right? A little hint, right? Actually, uh, Bill did have the answer. He was an insider. He was, saw the presentation at uh, Black Hat. Safety is to commercial aviation. Now, this uh, quote actually came from uh, Barksdale uh, about a year and a half ago, and he was relating the state of the internet security to um, the situation with air safety back in 1937. If we kept safety to 37 levels and had traffic increase to 1999 levels, we'd be dropping two 747s every day. I don't think many of us would be flying. Uh, that's the state of the internet security today, and that's what we've got challenged. Uh, challenges to uh, solve. <clears throat> so we're going to talk today about mobile code, and the mobile code is really a concept I think everybody's uh, at least at this point aware of because it really exists in just about any website you go to. Uh, people are transferring it through other means as well, through email, uh, through FTPs, through downloads, and so forth. Um, so most sites are enabled. What we're talking about is traditionally Java and ActiveX. Uh, obviously expanding out to scripting languages, JavaScript, VB scripts, um, but anything could be mobile code. Excel spreadsheets are containers of data. The data itself could be code, could be malicious, uh, and we actually have seen cases in the past where Excel spreadsheets have been used to carry some uh, malicious code and bootstrap it onto your systems. Uh, greeting cards that you may get may in fact be trojanized, and we'll show you some of those a little bit later. But generally the concept here is something that's moved between two points, uh, usually with some malicious intent, and usually without a lot of uh, activity or action on the part of the user to get it going. Uh, this was a little historical. Uh, some of you may be a little more advanced than that, but that's okay. There's always new people and they have to get up to speed. About a month and a half ago, we had the love letter. And right after the love letter, there's a guy by the name of Zivernovsky over in Russia. Now, maybe some of you are politically astute and know this guy's a little bit on the fringe. Uh, nevertheless, he had a couple of really interesting comments that he made publicly, as he always does. Uh, and one of them was, hey, we're going to knock you all down uh, with this type of code. Uh, we can launch these things. We can have our scientists uh, create really interesting attacks and send them out to you. Um, and he was really uh, piggybacking off of all the press and the hype that we got off of uh, Love Letter. Uh, now, you, you put this one aside and you say, well, you know, if this radical individual is saying this, uh, what about all the people that are not looking for the publicity? What about the non-politicians who are actually doing it? Uh, and then you start to get a little worried. So, you know, you look at the risk criteria here and you look at a number of categories, you know, of tools that you're using in the internet space, uh, receiving mail, opening attachments, surfing the web, using the instant messengers. Uh, these are all mechanisms by which you move code from outside of your system onto your system. It's not just the floppy drive we used to use back in 1990 or the CD-ROM. So if we look at this, and this I have to give credit, I have uh, a whole team of people here in the front row that I used to work with uh, when I was back at FinJohn. And one of the guys who developed uh, some of our, our best uh, script uh, attacks over there was a guy by the name of Paul, a marketing guy. And, you know, marketing guy turned script kitty. You know, he's, he's working his way up. He's here at DEF CON this year learning and trying to move himself up to the next level. But in any case, what he really was able to demonstrate was something that I think everybody should be aware of, how easy it is to go out of the uh, network that you know and love, uh, go over to, say, an internet cafe, uh, have some anonymity, uh, do a couple of searches very quickly on some tools, uh, Joiner, Binder, all these tools that allow you to put two bad things, to, uh, bad thing together with a good thing, and basically create your own Trojan, right? Nasty stuff. Well, um, some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, 
software out there, Joiner in particular, is so easy to use, it's got a graphical user interface. I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that, right? Bad program, good program, combine them together. Now you've got a good program on top, bad program on the bottom. Send it off to somebody, right? Send a greeting card to your boss. I'm not advocating that. But send a greeting card to your boss, you know, and suddenly he opens up that greeting card, happy birthday, and uh, underneath you've uh, got a little back office install going. Right? Now you can listen to what's going on on his machine, see what he's doing, you know, see what he's typing about your review. Um, again, not advocating this. Uh, you know, don't try this at home. Right? <laughs> But if you were to try it at home, the tools are, are available, right? And Paul, my little script kitty over there, you know, did a great job. So let's do uh, an example that I think will make a lot of sense, will help it bring it home. We're going to interrupt the PowerPoint. We're going to scoot down into Lotus, right? The press has always talked about, um, what is that other program that they use? Outlook. Outlook, right. That, that was it. So the press always talks about Outlook being susceptible, but I mailed myself uh, something in Lotus. Uh, two little things here, games and a pinwheel. We're going to launch the pinwheel and see how it works here. So this thing is going to take off. This is exactly how I would launch it if I got anything and this thing goes around. Oh, that's cute, you know. Go look at it. And it says, uh, I think, hit escape to uh, exit. Uh, lo and behold, you know, little semantic thing pops up, tells you what was going on. And uh, if you, if you actually view, hit the, there's a couple things, you probably can't read what it says, but we actually created a little directory there. Um, and, and to uh, uh, see what's going on there, uh, we moved a couple of files. Uh, let's see, there's board minutes from April 2000. There's uh, some letters to some girlfriend, uh, memory scan documents, um, all kinds of other things that we moved into this directory. Uh, certainly, we could have moved them out the uh, open internet connection. Uh, should I have been at the moment of time when I was connected, or when I launched this, connected to the net? Um, if we look at some of the other things we did, if this was a Sony Veo or some other machine with an actual uh, camera attached, I could have activated the camera. I could have recorded uh, what was going on in the room. Um, in this particular case, uh, there isn't a camera on this machine, but there is a microphone. And if we listen, so we'll launch it. If I got anything, and this thing goes around, oh, that's cute. You know, go look at it. Right, the microphone was enabled, engaged, um, and we recorded some, some information here. Now, some of you out there saying, okay, I'm a little smarter than you. I'm going to disable the microphone, right? I can get into my Windows environment, disable the microphone. I say, wait a minute, I just installed some, uh, I just ran an executable on your system. You think I can't re-enable what you disabled? And some of you are a little smart and you say, well, I'm going to remove the DLLs, the uh, actual software that caused the microphone to work. And, and I say, well, you know, I'm installing software on your machine, I can reinstall those DLLs. And some of you are smart and you say, well, I can cut the wire to the microphone. And I say, well, I can't reestablish that. <laughs> and then, of course, there was um, a guy who came up to me the other day from um, uh, this little uh, group called InQtel. Anybody ever heard of those guys? You know, they're the uh, venture capital arm of the CIA. That makes sense. Um, and, and they said, look at this little nifty device. And he actually can plug it into the side of the... Um, uh, input mic here and actually disables it uh, temporarily and it really does act as a sever device, it's a piece of hardware. Unfortunately, he, he uh, kind of laughed about that. He said every so often he bumps up against it and breaks it so he's got a whole supply of these things. Um, but, but there are things you can do. Obviously, if you've got a camera, you can tape it up and so forth. But these are really serious things. Think about uh, the idea that about a year ago, I think it was, uh, the State Department was bugged, right? Somebody was physically planting a listening device in one of the conference rooms of the State Department. And you think about that and you say, does that make any sense? I mean, what information is actually useful at the State Department? I'd much rather bug uh, the CEO's office at uh, Symantec and find out that, you know, Accent is in play and, uh, you know, do some uh, uh, stock trades in advance of that announcement. You know, that's obviously much more valuable information. So if I could install uh, telephony information, internet telephony, turn on the microphone and just siphon information uh, out of that uh, environment, uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty exciting. Um, obviously, there's uh, standard information you can get about the environment in which you're executing, and we showed that as well. Let's go back to the program that we've already got going here. And we'll go on and talk about some other things like how you deal with this. 
so if you look at this concept, this personal surveillance protection idea, uh, you wonder whether it's uh, true. Can you actually block these things? Now, again, I just discovered that there's a piece of hardware that you can temporarily plug into the side of your machine to block uh, the microphone. Um, and, and that's that's novel. Uh, can you do it in software? Can you do it without adding hardware to your machine? Um, can you prevent things from being bugged? I mean, yeah, this is a controversial slide. Uh, you know, some would argue that back office is a good thing. Some would argue that it's a bad. I'm not here to create the controversy. Um, what I'm simply saying is some people may want to know uh, when back office is, is installed on their machine, and some may not. Uh, those who do uh, obviously want to know if there's a way to prevent back orifice from getting on there. Um, it was interesting, the government guys, they actually run these uh, experiments all the time. They've been listening to each other for years. Um, and you know, they're talking about this now. So this stuff is real. This personal surveillance uh, is happening. It's possible. Here's the classic one, right? Where's the antivirus? You know, what's it doing? Antivirus is a pattern matching approach. It's a reactive process, right? We first have to know that something is bad. We first have to know that you've trojanized a greeting card, right? Understand the pattern in that greeting card, and then put that pattern into the pattern database, which then has to be shipped into uh, your desktop. Um, code scanning is looking for fragments of code that we know, right? This is how antivirus works. This is how it's worked for ten years or more. Um, so the idea is that you can only anticipate so far, right? You can only ex anticipate what the next attack stream may be. Uh, you don't necessarily have full capability to stop every new and novel attack. Um, and that's primarily because there's no dynamic inspection capability inside of the AV product. Um, and if you did start to tweak up heuristics or statistical analysis, uh, what would happen is you would get a lot of false positives and people would be scratching their heads saying, what the heck am I supposed to do now? Overblocking is a traditionally di uh, difficult problem to deal with. Um, if you look at why this isn't really uh, quite adequate, um, the updates being done after files have been deleted uh, don't quite help you get the files back. So the idea is you want to make sure you don't get the files deleted from your system beforehand. Um, again, adequate for catching known attacks, uh, but not necessarily sufficient for all the new attacks that are coming down the line. And while obviously we're very good at what we do, uh, and we are able to catch a number of variations, like post love letter, uh, able to catch 31 variations uh, following that particular uh, virus or worm, uh, we aren't necessarily uh, able to predict what the next one might be, like new love. Um, some of the heuristics are getting better, especially since the machines can handle it a little better today than they could in the past. Uh, but nevertheless, we still have this issue of false positives. Uh, the idea of getting more reactive is actually a really good one, and, and that's one that makes sense as well. It's a closed loop system that allows you to uh, have something quarantined temporarily and have it inspected and analyzed in an upstream fashion uh, so that new definitions or new updates regarding that particular bad attack uh, can be pushed back down. Uh, and this closed loop system actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, it, the whole point of this uh, exercise here is to restrict the propagation, right? In the old days, when it was sneaker net, when it was isolated to a particular land segment, uh, we could go out and stop that segment from infecting other segments. Um, we had human time involved. Today, we don't have the human time involved, so anything we can add to slow down propagation allows us to then function as humans and get back to the business of stopping these uh, types of attacks. This uh, series of quotes I've liked uh, a lot. I've used it for a long time. Um, and I still use it today because it still makes sense. It's still valid. Uh, the guys over at Trend, our products are inherently reactive. The guys at Net Network Associates, uh, for those who don't know, that's the McAfee guys. Uh, it's impossible to, to, de to detect all the variables associated with bad attacks, malicious attacks in advance. Uh, and even my uh, friend, Kerry Notchenberg, over at uh, Symantec has said we need to re-examine the way we solve this problem, this uh, antivirus strategy that we've been relying on for the last decade. So let's see where we're going here. 
we believe that uh, the ICSA has it right. Uh, Trojans and Win32 viruses, yes guys, they're a little harder than the scripts, but you gotta get into it, uh, are gonna be the way that uh, people are going to attack systems in the future. Uh, why? Because users can be social engineered on the electronic front uh, quite easily, right? It's easy to get email from your boss and say, this must be valid, and click it and open it. Um, and once this, e this executable starts to launch, it has all the rights and capabilities all the privileges you have as a user. Uh, so these things are very significant. So, what do we do now? When we start to look at behavior blocking technologies. We start to understand the types of behaviors that we think are undesirable, types of behaviors we think are desirable. Uh, we want to monitor what programs are doing on the system. We want to understand where they're going, what they're trying to reach into, what they're trying to uh, accomplish. Um, and using that uh, theory or that concept of behavior blocking, uh, it is possible to stop bad things without having to rely on updates or pattern updates or definitions. Uh, this is very complementary, in fact, to traditional heuristics as well as traditional uh, uh, pattern-based antivirus. Um, some of the original research in this area uh, came out of Finjan uh, about a year and a half ago or so, uh, and it talked about the idea that we want to intercept uh, behaviors at the lowest level of the operating system, ring zero. Uh, and sitting as a, you know, what some would term as a proxy between the executable that's running and the operating system, in fact, in fact becomes very uh, useful in stopping requests for operating system services uh, that would otherwise uh, be very nasty, right? So the idea is identify the operating system services that are higher risk, uh, sit between those services and the executable, track executables as they come onto the system, uh, understand uh, what those executables, uh, where those executables are, are spawning processes, track each of the processes, and eventually understand that the processes that they've spawned may in fact be dangerous. Uh, this is a very safe way of doing it, and it's very efficient because the uh, executable actually sits way down at the uh, operating system level. It's a very small uh, piece of code, um, and it's very strong against common uh, application attacks that we've seen in the past, and likely very strong against attacks in the future. Also, because it's not sitting out in the user mode, it's sitting down in the kernel, uh, it's, it itself happens to be a little bit more uh, protected uh, than an application that might sit at, at ring three. Um, you force programs in this uh, theory and this uh, technique to run inside of this sandbox, so to speak, uh, by wrapping them up front and then forcing their execution through this, um, uh, uh, this driver. If you look at, and this, this particular log, again, unrelated to the Finjohn stuff, but if you look at the type of things that you can track or that you might be looking to track, um, I ran, or, or Mark ran before the, um, the uh, executable called uh, Pinwheel. Uh, this log is from an executable called Games and, and subsequently a, uh, uh, another one called uh, Cartoon. Uh, but you can see what this particular program is trying to do. It's trying to open up a bunch of files, a bunch of programs uh, in the Windows directory, and you start to think, well, that doesn't seem like a logical thing. That doesn't seem like a good thing. Uh, this program probably is not going to do something good. Uh, and based on that type of behavior, you can then shut it down. Now, what else is interesting here is that you see all the PIDs, all the process IDs that are being uh, generated, and you can actually track these back so you have a hierarchical relationship between PIDs that have uh, been spawned by, say, Outlook or Lotus, uh, and see that you want to track those, uh, perhaps more with, with greater intent or with greater uh, observation than you might PIDs that are spawned off of something else. We still need a lot more research in this area of executable uh, blocking or behavior blocking. Uh, obviously, finer granularity on programs like Outlook themselves, uh, subclassing the Outlook objects uh, so that we get greater control over the behavior that we want to monitor. Uh, otherwise, we're going to still have the traditional problem of over blocking. Um, 
We also have to understand that um, a lot of these things can in fact be stopped uh, by looking at the very simple operations uh, that uh, scripts and, and other executables use. Uh, so we can stop things like Love Leather, like Explorer Zip uh, fairly well. And to the extent that uh, people tend to duplicate off of existing uh, bad code, um, we have a good chance of stopping a lot of the uh, repeat attacks. Um, if we look at uh, a narrower focus and, uh, and, and uh, specifically looking at the scripts, um, again, with Love Letter, there were 31 variations of Love Letter, uh, and you have to be able to anticipate what those variations may do. Um, we can look at uh, attacks based on common vulnerabilities without the side effects of false positives or overblocking. Um, this is really good technology for stopping uh, tr traditionally uh, script-oriented attacks, and a lot of those are things that we've seen in the last year or so. Um, we can also look at the um, idea that uh, instantiation of objects uh, spawned by specific programs that are higher risk, like Outlook, uh, maybe you can throw Lotus in there as well, um, uh, is in fact very important as well. Uh, we want to be able to understand where it's going. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to um, to uh, Mark, and he's going to talk about uh, some of the technology that he's been able to uh, pull together in the last uh, uh, few months or year. Hi. And earlier this year, I was tasked with trying to address the, worm ba uh, the script based worm attacks that were had started with Bubble Boy and CAC, and later achieved more fame or infamy with Love Letter and Stages. So I was working on a technology which I call Gatekeeper. I wanted to eliminate the scripting engine as the vehicle that worms can attack your system, primarily because when a worm is distributed as a script, you're distributing the source code. And anyone with Notepad can make a new variation and send it on its way. That's what we saw with Love Letter. Most of the Love Letter variations, they changed the subject line, they changed the body of the message, they didn't touch the code because most of the people making those changes didn't understand the code, but they didn't need to. So script is a, requires a much lower level of sophistication for people to do. Microsoft is excellent at providing examples of how to do this stuff. A lot of the worms came from Microsoft sample programs. So I want to close that address uh, down and make it harder for people to write these things. So I came up with a prototype technology for addressing the script-based attacks. When it was done, it provided 100% protection against all of these script-based attacks, even though, while writing it, I had never seen what these things were doing. I just knew the behaviors that they had to do in order to accomplish what they had been doing. It blocks Outlook emailers, too, like Melissa, even though that was running as a macro inside Word. It runs on all the Win32 platforms where Microsoft supports scripting. It's very low overhead. It's only brought into play when the objects that can cause damage are brought into play. And we'll be posting a working beta of this soon. It can work bundled with an AV solution. Uh, it's sort of akin to our auto-protect solution. Uh, or it could be packaged as a standalone product. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about how it works. Script in and of itself can't do anything. It doesn't have any persistent storage native to the scripting interface. In order to do this, it must make use of certain objects, the Windows scripting host object, the file system object, and the Outlook object being the most common. These objects are all known. If we limit access to the potentially dangerous aspects of these objects, we can render these scripts powerless. We do this by stealing COM interfaces. It, it gets a little technical here, but uh, the scripting interfaces are implemented via COM mechanism. COM is a common interface with uh, various invocation methods that can be employed. These methods cannot change. It's one of the rules of COM. We infiltrate this position ourselves between the scripting engine and the COM objects, and we can then limit what they're doing. We're instantiated on demand, so we're only loaded when the potentially dangerous objects are loaded. What about good scripts? Microsoft came up with the scripting engines because 
it's a useful technology. Uh, if you're an admin for a large network and you need to deploy a job across uh, your organization, script is a very useful way of doing that. Microsoft likens it to the batch files from the DOS environment, and those were very useful. These scripts will use the same objects that the malicious ones do. How do you tell the good guys from the bad guys? The only difference between a good script and a bad script is intent. And intent is very difficult to gauge. So we came up with GateKey. Through GateKey, we can allow an organization to sign, not digitally sign, it's not quite the same thing there, but they can indicate this script originated from within our organization, therefore it is going to be trusted. It's a companion technology to Gatekeeper. Yes. This, this is a uh, uh, first generation pass at it. Ultimately, you can digitally sign the script itself <coughs> and use that signature. Uh, but the mechanism is what really is being discussed here is not that it isn't spoofable, but rather that you need to have a mechanism to sign what you've created and then use that reference. Uh, the keys, also, the keys would be at a very uh, small functional unit. So maybe my division has its own key for running the scripts within that. So you could spoof my key and run in my division, but as soon as I send it over to another division, it's not going to run there because it doesn't have their key. So it's designed to stop the broad-based attack. Love Letter went out to everybody. Anyone running a script could be affected by it. But if they had been running this technology, they wouldn't have been. It communicates with Gatekeeper to allow access to, and full functionality to the objects if the script is trusted. The administrator specifies the keys, so it protects you against external attacks. Internal ones are another issue. There's follow-on technologies we could do with that, but uh, that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about what actually happens in the scripting engines when you don't have Gatekeeper. Wscript.exe is invoked. It then goes out and invokes the scripting engine to run the script. It passes the text of the script to be parsed, and then it tells the scripting engine to execute it. While it's executing, the scripting engine will come across a create object of the file system object. That will go instantiate the file system object using COM interfaces. Same thing when we do the scripting shell. What we now call open text file will invoke the open text file method of the scripting object, or of the file system object. Same thing is true when we go to the reg write command. Now when we have gate key installed, when the scripting engine is loaded by WScript, gate key gets installed first. And it insinuates itself between WScript and the scripting engine. It then gets first crack at the source of the script and it checks it to see if it contains the key. It just remembers that fact, yes, I saw the key, no, I didn't see the key, and it doesn't do anything else at this point. And we allow execution to continue. When the scripting engine goes to create the file system object, the operating system is fooled into loading Gatekeeper. It then instantiates the real object. It's now again sitting between the scripting engine and the file system engine, the file system object. Same thing is true when we go and we do the uh, Windows scripting shell. Now, when they do to that open text file, we steal that interface. All the interfaces went through scripting and com must come through a method called invoke. That's where we're sitting. We then go check with Gatekeeper, or with, uh, we intercept the call, and we go up and check with Gatekey to see if it saw the key. If it did see the key, everything's fine and dandy, we allow the call to go through. We're functionally invisible at this point to running without Gatekeeper. Same thing true when you go through the shell object. Now if you don't have Gatekey, if the, or we didn't have the key installed, when we check with Gatekeeper, or Gatekey to see if it had the key, it's going to come back and say no. Now we block the invoke. So you can instantiate the file system object, you just can't use any of the methods on it. It's worthless. Same thing happens on the other objects that we protect. So we what, have the, a what this ultimately means is that uh, we're pushing you toward, uh, away from scripts, because we think we have a pretty good approach to uh, stopping those, and forcing you back into the Win32 world. Uh, job security for the SARC guys. Uh, we have a little demonstration here. I don't know how many of you we're exposed to the new love uh, worm that came out about two weeks after Love Letter. Uh, it didn't reach wide penetration. Um,
partially because it was sort of like the Ebola virus. It killed its host before it could replicate. It was very deadly. Uh, so what I'm going to do is actually run it on this machine. And we say, don't try this at home. Okay, now we're running in a virtual NT box. We have the new love worm, well, assuming it's just coming to you as an attachment. So we launched the, the code. And we don't see anything happening. But while this is running, come on. Okay. So here, while this thing's running in the background, we're looking at the WinNT system 32 directory. DBScript isn't the fastest executing code in the world, so it's a, it will take a little while, but uh, the effect will be worth and this it. Is, this is also on top of VMware. We obviously didn't want to clobber the machine in... in yes. No actual bits were harmed in the making of this video. So, No, it's not a service. It has infiltrated the COM infrastructure and gets invoked via the normal COM method methods. Not from within script. As I said, the point of... You would have to be executing 32-bit code in order to get around it. And if you're 32-bit code, you don't need the scripting interfaces. You have access to the machine. So we're trying to limit the playing field and say, we're going to take VBS and JavaScript away from you, so now you have to write 32-bit code. And by that, making it, uh, raising the bar. <coughs> Pardon me? Those are not accessible from script, except by mechanism. Oh, here we go. Now we're seeing something. Anything? There we go, yeah. Notice uh, all my files are changing into VBS. And if we change the view here, not only are they now all VBS, they're all zero length. So that, that VM environment, that machine... The Windows directory. The Windows directory was shot. And uh, it's still off busy doing this to every file on the system. And once it finishes every file on the system, it's going to go to all your network drives and do the same thing. Uh, when I said that it killed too quickly, and in a lot of cases, it sent itself along through Outlook, but it then deleted Outlook's DLLs before Outlook had a chance to actually send the message. <laughs> Somebody's got to teach these guys better logic. It has that potential. The, in the first cut of it, I said, no access whatsoever. Now, I'm sitting on all the interfaces. I can not only look at the interfaces that you're calling, but I can look at the parameters at which you're calling it with. So I could say, if you want to delete a file in the temporary directory, that's fine. If you want to delete a file in the Windows system directory, that's off limits. But in you know, development is, goes through stages, I said, let's start with the most restrictive and thereby the easiest for me to write, because as all programmers, I'm inherently lazy. Uh, I'll put this very draconian solution in effect and see if anyone squeals. If it works, great. If we get pushback on it, we, can, we have the ability to go further down and refine these policies. The same is true of the, uh, the way that we control um, this, the digital signatures. There's more intrusive methods that we could do, but they would inter introduce levels of complexity into the system. In the current version, a user is empowered to enable his script to run. He can physically add the key necessary to make a script run. No administrator interface is required. We could go to more restrictive models, but then if I'm a script writer in my organization and I want to write a script, I have to now submit it to somebody else 
to sign it and verify that it's okay before it comes back to me. That's going to be a barrier against deployment in some organizations. We'll do that if that's what they want. Now let's go to a VM running Gatekeeper and see what would have happened. And this actually did happen when I received the first sample of New Love. <coughs> These VMs were stored in a suspended state, so they take a little while to come back. <coughs> but not as long as booting NT4. So now we're launching the same new love worm. There's a lot of swapping going on here. This is a uh, this machine's got about 192, 256, 256, but there's two VMs running on it, in addition to its native operating system. Okay, we run the worm now. Gatekeeper has intercepted the call. It tells you what program was executing it, what script file, which kind of got clipped off there, was trying to execute it, what method it was trying to call, and on what, uh, what object it was using and what method it was trying. Now, you'll notice here, Gatekeeper is not asking me if I want to allow this. Every user who was affected by New Love or by Love Letter answered yes to the question, do you want to run this? It might have a virus. Asking doesn't work. People will say yes. Then they're dead. So we don't ask, we tell. Not, not realistic. When? What? <laughs> right. Does it, right. No, when it stopped it, if they knew that it was good, they could go in and add the signature that allows it to run on that machine, and then they can run the script. The, the end user is empowered to do that. Then they probably shouldn't be running it. Uh, again, this is, this, as Mark was alluding to earlier, <clears throat> the idea here is to uh, reduce the threat, limit the propagation of uh, malicious code, as it's moving rapidly across the network. Uh, this is far from being uh, what we would call enterprise ready or carrier class ready. Uh, this is very early stage research that we think is uh, pretty interesting in terms of being defensive uh, services that could be deployed. Uh, and even if they were deployed today, uh, creating a very harsh environment, or you know, in Mark's words, draconian, uh, it would still have a very good effect in terms of uh, pushing people away from, say, script writing and into things that are a little bit more sophisticated, uh, Win32 writing. Yeah? The, these aren't, these aren't uh, in the sense of keys. We, we use the word very loosely. Uh, it is just basically a sequence uh, at this point. Again, just a proof of concept. Uh, this is research. This isn't commercial product. Mm -hmm. uh, function, then you get kernel executing, uh, allegedly legitimate call. What's like kernel executing at that point? The, uh, the question was, what about a buffer overflow exploit where it's not, you don't know exactly who is executing the code that's been injected into the system. It would be masquerading, it said, as kernel running it. But in that case, it wouldn't be kernel executing it. It would be Outlook or Outlook Express or Internet Explorer. And if you have a policy, in fact, that says Internet Explorer is not allowed to go in and modify my Windows system directory, it doesn't matter how Internet Explorer was coerced into doing that, it will be stopped from doing it. Other questions?
The question was, when I named the product Gatekeeper, or the, the project Gatekeeper, did I make allusions to the, uh, the movie The Net, where they actually created viruses in order to get people to install antivirus software, which was actually the real virus? No. <laughs> I just came up with a name. It, the, actually, the name is um, not fixed yet. This is the working, pro working title of it, uh, the final name. Not determined yet. Uh, architecture uh, folks, what's that? Based not based on Ghostbusters. It's just, just, if you really think about it, it's a gate and it's keeping out scripts. I mean, it's a fairly simple concept. Uh, and again, this is an internal code name, kind of like Whistler with, I, with uh, Microsoft guys, and it's, it's not uh, the final name. Yes. I work for Semantic. Uh, as quickly as I can get it up there. Yeah, we'd be. We're, we're, this will be out there and available for download. And your comments would be great. talking about is macros, not scripts. A lot of it depends on the organization with which you work. There are corporations that we deal with where scripting is a way of life, and disabling it is just simply not an option for them. Well, let me give you a better example of the type of things that are happening in corporate settings. Um, <clears throat> there is a uh, capability inside Excel uh, to call programs outside of Excel in order to execute programs and bring in their resulting data back into the Excel spreadsheet. Okay, now you kind of look at that and you say, well, that's pretty far-fetched. You know, and most people, in fact, don't use that function. Uh, but if you go into financial organizations, they actually have very complicated spreadsheets that take advantage of these uh, invocations uh, to bring things in. So now if you actually think of a spreadsheet as a carrier of malicious code, you could actually, let's call it uh, ASCII executable stuff, uh, sitting in an Excel spreadsheet uh, that you can save and then execute from the same Excel spreadsheet. Uh, that Excel spreadsheet can be moved over the web uh, from one point to the next. Uh, and as soon as it comes on board, because of the way the Windows operating system is configured, uh, it'll automatically associate the XLS object with the Excel application, launch the Excel application in the background, because your browser is still the primary, and allow this thing to then uh, take off. Now, uh, the response on the Microsoft end was, well, we're going to remove this function. Well, that's really going to your concept of let's remove uh, Word document functionality, uh, let's go to RTF. Well, the reality is there are corporations that rely on this functionality that can't eliminate it. Why 
Well, I, I mean, you could translate that to the entire web infrastructure saying those who are developing web services, forget about documents and Excel spreadsheets, look at the web services that are being developed. Uh, they're not always being developed by people with uh, understanding of how programs may affect people downstream. Uh, the unintentional use of some software is usually what is exploited, right? It's not the intentional use. The intentional use is usually well thought out, uh, but it's the unintentional side effects of a program that can be uh, used to uh, over, uh, you know, kind of buffer overflow concepts and things like that. Um, and so uh, if you look at that, really the problem is that we just have a lot of people writing code and that's not going to change. Um, and so you're going to expect uh, various quality in the code that's being pushed to you and therefore you're going to need some type of defensive uh, infrastructure to protect you against anything that may be coming at you. Other questions? We've got some time, I think. Or, or not. One more question, if there's any. There's one over there. I can't, can't hear you. Do you want to repeat the question, too? Uh, what was the extension you put on it? Bat? Okay, so the question was, what if somebody makes a batch file that goes in and modifies the registry in such a way to allow the batch file to execute script? Is that, is that what you're getting at? Potentially that's possible. Uh, as far as Gatekeeper is concerned, and this, won't, uh, this may not sound like a real satisfactory answer to you at this point, but that is not a script-based attack at that point. It's a batch attack, which we have other technology that we're working on that will address the problems that go beyond script. Part of it also is the reason that Love Letter was so successful is that people had never seen a VBS extension. A lot of people have been sensitized about running exes that they receive. Batch files also to a degree that were recognized as executable, but VBS, I've never seen this thing before. Maybe it's a picture. I don't know. I'll open it. All right. We'll be around the rest of the week. And so thanks for your time today, and uh, catch up with you later.